everyone. I'm Gloria. It's so nice to have you all here tonight. Thank you for joining us at South Park Commons. As Richie mentioned, South Park Commons is a community of technologists and entrepreneurs who have come together to support each other in launching uh, our next projects and taking bold risks into our more entrepreneurial adventures. Um, so our honored guest tonight, Mike Krieger, really needs no introduction. I think you all know who he is. Uh, Mike is the co-founder and chief technology officer of Instagram. Uh, he, during his time, well, ran out of all of technology, of course, but also grew the team from really just two people, him and Kevin Systrom, to over 450 people and three worldwide offices, uh, and has been super heavily involved in all of the team and culture building today. Uh, and so when Mike and I did our kind of pre-chat uh, pre chat, uh, I asked him, well, what do you want to focus on? Because uh, he and his wife, ha Caitlin, have also created the Future Justice Fund. They created that in 2015 as a way to give back to the community, uh, focused on a couple of topics that are near and dear to their hearts. And I was like, oh, do you want to talk about more of that work? And I, we thought that given uh, the focus of technologists and community kind of entrepreneurs in the room, we thought it'd be great to spend most of our time talking about the entrepreneurial journey. Who better than somebody who's been through so many of the ups and downs, but mostly the ups, than Mike to talk to us about this. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the format tonight will go till about 7.40. We'll have a very kind of informal fireside chat. And after that, we'll open up to 20 minutes of audience questions. So get your questions ready, uh, and then we'll end promptly at 8. Great. All right. So, so yeah, we've known each other for probably 12 years now at this point. I actually went back through my email inbox. I was like looking for oldest email from Mike Krieger. And we were actually uh, classmates at a Stanford program together, the Mayfield Technology Program designed for entrepreneurial students. Although at the time, the joke was that every single person who did that never started a company. And it was true. Like, I think for most of the Mayfield Fellows Program, like, we were fellows in 07. Right? Yeah. And like up to then, most people had left and like gone and worked at like investment banks and management consulting, basically. Pretty much, yeah. It was like a feeder to McKinsey. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there's literally a Quora answer where people are like, "Have any Mayfield fellows gone on to start notable <laughs> technology companies?" <laughs> it's actually, I think the year before us, Tristan Harris was a fellow, and he started. Apture, which is the company he did before he went to Google and before he did the Center for Humane Technology. But it was funny, he was like one of the first ones that like did the company. Um, but that was like the running joke. It's really weird going back now. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Stanford or were students there, but I remember when I was a uh, human computer interaction student, you did your HCI program, you did a class on interaction design, the final project was like make a like demo and like maybe make an app and like you would do it and then you would like present it and then people would like judge it and you were done. I go now and like I'm a guest judge, and every single person there is like, and I'm doing a company based on my like in, like CS 147 project. I'm like, you're a freshman, calm down, like enjoy your time <laughs> a little bit. But it's definitely changed. Yeah, and I would say that you know pretty much everybody who knew you back then is like zero percent surprised at all the amazing things that you've built and the success you've gone on to enjoy at Instagram. So it's been really a joy to get to know you over the years. Um, yeah, so what have you been doing since Instagram? Um, so I've left in October. Um, so I was there, it's pretty rare. I think most post-acquisition founders leave. I haven't learned the math, but I think it's like a year is probably the median, four is probably the maximum, you vest out after four years. We were there for over six, which I think is like pretty uncommon. Um, uh, and I left in October and you know, the first month was like travel and like don't think about technology. We went to Europe. It was like I think a very good thing. I think the hardest thing is to like go from doing something full time and then like the next day like being at home being like, what am I gonna do with my life? So I think it was good to like have a couple of, of weeks of travel. Um, and then I sort of stepped back and sort of figured out, and here's my metaphor for it, which is like if you think about Instagram, like the role I had there where I was CTO and co-founder, like I was getting a diet not of food, but of like activities and of things that were nourishing. So I got to work with really, really smart people. I got to work on hard problems. I got to learn. I got to explore technology. Um, and my kind of like approach for you know the first year after I leave, or after I left, is how can I fill those things, not necessarily with a bunch of full-time commitments, because I'm not sure what I actually want to commit to anymore. So you know, I've been advising some companies, and that fills sort of the like intellectual challenge of like, well, what do I do in this situation? How do I set up my first? Uh, product organization, you know, how do I hire my first eng manager? Like, I think these are questions that a lot of companies start facing once they 
kind of hit traction but haven't scaled yet. Um, and then there's like the intellectually curious technology side of me. So um, I should have a funny conversation with Fei Fei Li, who um, teaches the um, deep learning class at Stanford. I'm like, hey, I took your class because that was one of the first things I did after I left. Was I was like, oh, really? I am going to audit CS, what is it, like 293N or something like that, which is the, the deep learning class. And it's like, first of all, you like realize how much linear algebra you either never learned or have forgotten <laughs> since then. So like my first like few weeks were like, man, how do you like, it was like matrix multiplication 101. But then after a while, you're, like, you're getting into TensorFlow and that's really fun. Um, and then another interest of mine has always been 3D graphics and games. Not that I think I'm going to go make video games, but it's always been, I'm always interested in like, how do these things work? So I'm doing like a Unity class. So it's been a lot of like technical explorations. I don't know what they're going to lead to, um, but it's, it's really fun to like get my hands dirty and code again and like refamiliarize myself with things. Because like when I think about what led to Instagram, it was you know, when we were living together, I would like go to the weekends to coffee bar, which closed by the way. So like, none of the piece oh, of no. San Francisco history is gone. But I mean, they're like competing with Tartine Manufactory down the street. I don't think they really had a chance. But yeah. um, and I would go on the weekends and like build iPhone apps when that was you know still a fairly new thing in like 08, 09. So um, I think the tinkering may lead to something interesting down the line. I love that tinkering and entrepreneurial spirit. That's like what a lot of South Park Commons is about too. So you mentioned that you spend a lot of time advising companies now. So, I mean, given both the depth of your Instagram experience and the breadth of startups that you've gotten to know, like, what do you think is the most important thing for founders to get right? Or maybe we can split it up to a couple different phases. Yeah, like, what's more phases more are... important for them to get right in the very early kind of zero to one? phase where you're trying to find product market fit and that's all you care about really. Yeah, for sure. I think the phases, it varies a ton by phases. In that first phase, like the companies I've talked to, often they like have an intuition, have often relevant experience in the space, which I think is valuable or at least some like core insight there. Um, and the ones that like, I think manage to operationalize that most effectively is the ones that like are able to distill it down to what problem they're solving the quickest rather than like, this is the space. I'm going to focus on this space. Like obviously that's where you start um, or maybe you already have the problem and that's great. But when I look back on Instagram, what we did well was, all right, like zoom back. And it's a little hard to imagine 2009, like people didn't have, you know, fancy iPhone X or whatever the latest one is like they had the 3G and you barely could take good photos, not even good photos, but you could take photos with it. And like at t had just rolled out 3G in San Francisco, mm -hmm. but you could see how these things were converging. But you know, we could have done a number of things with that, but we distilled it down to like, all right, photos on the phone are ugly, so let's make them look good. It's really slow to upload, so let's like be maniacal about performance. And it's really fragmented right now, so people need to share across like multiple networks. So let's make that really easy. Um, and that's what the conversations I've had a lot with folks that are on the early stage. I'm like, if you could solve nothing else but like one or two problems that are like the most important problems, like let's focus on that. And can you get your, get to the point where you've solve that and see if it's interesting. It's like the easiest trap to fall into, I think, is the, well, I don't have the two best problems, but maybe if I solve eight kind of problems kind of well, that'll work. And we fell into that trap at Instagram. Like the first six months of that company were us building an app that wasn't working and adding more features to the app that wasn't working in the belief that like the ninth feature was the thing that was going to tip it That's over. That's when it was bourbon, right? When it was bourbon. Yeah, I've never seen that user. playbook work, yeah, yeah. right? You know, it's mm -hmm. like either your core problem or like need or insight is good, and that's great. And like, it almost doesn't matter what you do in the other ones. Like, you can actually screw up pretty badly on the other ones, or you're not gonna like. It's really hard to imagine a path that will lead to success. Mm -hmm. I mean, Instagram um, is so well known for keeping like staying true to its core of just like simplicity and uh, you know just a really elegant design experience from end to end. How did you guys fight the temptation to do a million other things that are kind of natural extensions of that philosophy? I think that like the next, like there's a phase of startup that I've been talking to that also has that problem, which is like bright, shiny object and then the core thing that they're focused on. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you have that philosophy as founders, like it won't be a problem between you and your founders. It's actually way harder of a problem as you start building out the team because you make, you kind of are the bad guy, right? Like where your team comes up to you and they're like, we have this awesome idea. Like, do you guys remember Hyperlapse, the thing we launched that was like the side app that we did that lets you like accelerate videos? It was like a hackathon project. They built it out and they launched it and we're like, this is awesome. Like, but it's a tool. It's a utility that does one thing well. And I remember they came up to us and they're like, we'd like to like staff a team and do like eight people working on Hyperlapse or five people or whatever working on Hyperlapse. And we're like, I am sure there are like 
30 cool things you could build in this app, like slow motion hyperlapse, reverse, like there's so many cool things, but like you need to separate like things that are like cool ideas and actually might be really cool, but like are not gonna move the like needle of what you're really trying to go for and like say no aggressively. And it was hard, like internally, if you ask like somebody who, especially like, we got to see this uh, natural experiment because people would transfer over from Facebook to Instagram. And we'd ask people like three or four months in, like, all right, what do you notice is the difference? They're so, like, Instagram is very top down. Instagram is very founder driven. Like Instagram, it's very harder to get things done. <laughs> and it's true, but the trade off was we were really focused on a few different things and the product felt at its best anyway, like as a cohesive whole, um, but it, it was more top down. And I think what that really meant was being really focused on what you said, like yes or no to over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Steve Jobs said, saying yes is about saying no to a hundred things. Did you feel like that was true during your time? Yeah, and then, but the trick though is like you can't, you can't just be in the rotation of like, well, I'm gonna be the gatekeeper that says yes or no to things. Like eventually you have to get the team to think the same way as you do or else like it's just very frustrating and nobody's gonna be happy. So I think the place we got to eventually that was a much healthier place was if we could agree on what problems are, were being solved by the team, and we generally trusted the team to go solve those problems, like we felt, like Kevin and I felt like we could step back and not be like, all right, you're gonna build features A and B and C, and instead, like we had like six month planning cycles, and let's take the stories team. We talked to the stories team and they would say, all right, we think the biggest like opportunity for stories is right now, people need to take like photos of something that they're doing out in the world, but we're trying to grow with the teen market. Teens actually don't do that many interesting things. They're mostly like, at home doing homework, like we want to create fun things for them to do when they're not out and about, like polls and, you know, but they even didn't necessarily have the ideas of like polls or question stick or whatever. We're like, we, that's the opportunity. And we're like, cool, I buy that. Like at this point, am I the right person? This was like six or seven years into the company. Am I the right person to come up with the next 10 ideas? <sighs> Definitely not. Um, but the thing that we would say no to though, is they might say like, oh, also we think another cool opportunity with stories is like, I'm making this up, like audio only stories or this other thing. And like, you can say no to like problems to be solved mm -hmm. and then focus on the ones that matter and then let the team's creativity run loose within that space mm -hmm. of like what solves that problem well and hold them accountable at the end of the, you know, six months and say, well, you said you were gonna move content production with teens, did you or not? And were the projects the right projects or not? Yeah, so that's really interesting. So in addition to kind of setting high level goals or hey, here are the problem areas we're gonna go solve as a company and putting a stake in the ground on that. How did you help, you and Mike help the team understand like, okay, and in addition, here are some of our like principles or here's how you should think about things. Did you guys set up like product review? Did you have like a cadence of like, I don't know, micro, yeah, how did that work? Yeah, which definitely we like outscaled it and it was like the thing people hated the most about working at Instagram <laughs> as designers because you know, early on it was like, product review was like me, Actually, we were, our first office was five or six doors down at 164 South Park. Our second office was at 181. So like, this is like a little homecoming of being, cool being back in South Park. But it was like four of us in a room and product review was, hey, Shane, who's our first engineer, come over. Like, what does this look like? Right, is it good? Okay, cool, ship it. You know, that was also our release process. Like it was very simple then. And as we scaled, it was like, all right, let's do product reviews the same way, but have our designers come in. We eventually hired designers, like, you know, show what we're doing. Eventually though, like we, we were a multi-threaded company that had a big choke point, which was product review with Mike and Kevin. And people dreaded it, not just you know because product reviews can be a little stressful, but because they'd be like, well, I finished this project on Tuesday and you're telling me that the next time I can see you is next Wednesday. I literally have nothing to do for a week or like I can go move. You, they have two choices at that point, do nothing, which kind of sucks. You know, nobody wants to feel unproductive or go work on like some lower priority thing. But the problem is like once the design happens, it's like, they want to get an engineer or it's just like a mess. So we eventually realized that product review, product reviewing everything was unscalable and like not healthy for the company. So we separated things. And I've had this conversation with several like founders who are at that like a hundred person scale at companies where they're like, I don't want to ship bad stuff, but I also like my team hates me now, you know? And it's like, I think you get to pick maybe two founder led things. Like for us, like I remember when we worked on stories, it was like, we care a lot about stories. It means we're clearing most of our calendar and focusing on stories. And we're gonna make that clear up front. You're kind of signing up for that if you're gonna be like an engineer or a designer on that team. But a bunch of the other projects, not that they weren't important, but they weren't like, they didn't require that much founder involvement, could like run free and we like de, what I put it, like de-founderized the product review process as much as possible. So product reviews were happening at the like team or maybe like this organizational level, not at the founder level. It's scary because it means that like sometimes you're, you know, we dog fooded everything, so, but you'd open the dog foodie app and be like, 
well, that, that is not how I would have done that. And you have to be okay with it, you know, as long as it's not terrible, you know. Sometimes, and rarely you have to invoke the like, no, we actually can't ship this, I'm sorry. Like, I try not to intervene, but like, this is really not a thing that we should actually ship. But most of the time, I would say 95% of the time, we would, were pleasantly surprised by the things that made it out in there uh, in dog fitting. Yeah. How did you handle the, the core part, though? Like, was there still product review for that? Let's say for stories that one year. You know, for stories that one year, Yes, and I think like the thing that we did well is was separating the idea of like design review and decision review. We ended up finding that like the thing holding teams back was not, you know, how rounded should the posting button be or what color is it? It was should you use your existing graph for stories or should it be a new graph? Mm -hmm. And should stories expire after a day or 3 days and should it be and like so what we got teams to do and this is like if we did one thing really well in the later, later years of Instagram in sort of terms of scaling product decision making, it was this. Like we would have people come in and have enumerated like all the decisions that they were like considering. And it was like, it was literally in a like bullet form yeah. and it's categorized by something like, you know, you know, stories, like, you know, content like behavior or graph. And then we'd go in there and they would have like, here are the, enumerate the five options. Often they would bold the ones that like, we really think we should do this. And often we're like, that sounds good. You know, sometimes, sometimes they're like, we, we're stuck on these two pros and cons. Like, what's your instinct based on like having worked on this thing for eight years? And we would make a call then. But what was amazing is that like, rather than like sit around and like, you know, try to handle these decisions ad hoc, which yeah. when you're founders, you're just doing other stuff. So it's like, you're going to be a blocker that way. We try to get as much out of the way as possible. And often that would mean the team could go run for like two weeks. Um, and then come back with like the implementation of all the things that you just decided. It was like a massively more effective way um, of getting stuff done and empowering to the teams because we didn't want people to come in and say, hey, we have these four options. We wanted to come in and say like, we have a strong perspective on this. Like we just want to gut check it before we like make an irreversible, you know, change. It's hmm. really interesting. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that early stage and maybe we can move on to scaling the company mm -hmm. in the next phase next. Um, so, I mean, what do you think it was about those early days when you guys really got to, when you're considering like, you know, all these different, when you're going from bourbon mm -hmm. to what would later become Instagram, like what, how did that process of discovery work around like getting to that right product? Like how did you know how to find it, what it looked like? How did you iterate to get there before you got it? We were, so bourbon at peak, so bourbon, you can find screenshots on it online. It was a HTML5 based, like Foursquare competitor. And remember, it was like 2008, 2009, Foursquare and Goala and Looped were like- I just launched at just, South by Southwest. Yeah, it was like a huge big and, thing. Yeah. But we're like, they don't have photos and videos, which is like funny to take that for granted now, but they didn't, it was just check-ins. And we think like Android's an, op an interesting opportunity, it was just starting to grow, we could do an HTML5. Um, but that never took on, like we had like a thousand users at peak. So like, you know, like for a social app, that's not very many at all. Um, Bourbon, let's see, Kev was working on Bourbon like kind of as a side project probably for four-ish months. But in earnest, I had to get my H1B. <laughs> I had to change my H1B to go work at uh, like on, at Bourbon Inc. Um, and that was from basically April through, let's say like July or August. So what is that, like four-ish months of iteration? We wrote a native version because we're like, maybe it's the HTML5 thing that's not wrong with this app. And like wrote the native version and like sent it through test flight. And then August was kind of the like pivot point of like, this is not gonna work, let's change full, full steam and do Instagram. Mm -hmm. The way we did Instagram and kept ourselves sane, cause like, all right, the feeling in my stomach, I have only known it twice in my life. The first time was when I was a graduate student on a student visa and I knew I needed to finish by a certain date cause or else my visa was gonna be over. And I didn't know what my thesis topic was gonna be. And I was like, it was just like, pit, it's like feeling in the pit of your stomach. Like I'm not gonna finish, I'm gonna get deported. This is awful. Um, <laughs> And I have this time constraint. And the same thing was true with Instagram. Like once we like were decided not to do inst Instagram, I was like, one, like we don't have money forever. Like I really like working with Kevin. Like this is a good co-founder. We should figure out how to do this. And like two, I feel like the world is moving and like we're stuck. So the way we stayed sane was um, reducing, I mean, I don't think I had the language to call them sprints at the time, but reducing our sprints to a week. So it was literally Monday morning. We didn't have like, and these things didn't exist at the time, like Trello, but like, we had Google Docs. And like we would make a list of like, what is the most important thing that we are solving this week? And under which category is it? Is it under making the photos look great? Is it around sharing it really quickly? Or is it around sharing it really broadly? Okay, like, all right, we need to like work on filters. That is the number one thing there. Okay, work really hard. Friday, how did we do? Then we shipped it to like our, at the time of test flight, you get 100 people. 
the way we knew we were onto something is that um, of those thousand bourbon folks, like maybe 50 were on our test flight. And every weekend we would have them use Instagram because weekends were always like the peak for Instagram. Right. Like even the much smaller group, like 1 20th of the size was way outpacing the posting behavior of bourbon. We're like, okay, we were onto something interesting here, even within this core like group. The metrics were kind of telling you. Yeah, uh, to the extent that we had metrics, which was like, open the app, be like, oh, there's a lot of photos in yeah. here. It was not super, <laughs> super well instrumented. Yeah, um, yeah. But we like knew that it was, it was something that was catching. And uh -huh. I think we were keeping ourselves honest to like working through something every week. And it's like one of the most painful things in scaling a company is like you go from that level of iteration speed to like, you know, we built Instagram from basically scratch in four months, three and a half months maybe, like, and other parts of Instagram much later on would take like four months to build like a sub part of a sub part of a feature and like we can go into like why I think that is but there's nothing like that initial like open space like mm -hmm. iteration speed especially with like two and then three people that were hyper focused and like were able to stick to a like weekly schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah especially when you feel like your back's against the wall and you gotta exactly. you gotta make something. Yeah yeah for sure. Huh. Okay so that's a great segue into kind of the next phase of the founder journey so once you guys, you know, really when Instagram, it was like, I mean, the charts were like this, I'm sure. Uh, like, what were some of the hardest things or hardest lessons that you had to learn as a founder in terms of like, how do I go and scale this company and, and make some thoughtful decisions uh, in the right way? Um, recruiting, 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 recruiting. Like number one through 10 is yeah. recruiting. So I, um, the metaphor I like is like, I thought recruiting was like a switch, you're like, great, we need like 10 engineers tomorrow, like who's ready? And this is just from an experience, right? But I think recruiting is actually more like turning a faucet on, but actually the water needs to come from like a mountain that like needs to have snow melt. Like it's a long process. Like we like worked with one um, recruiter temporarily and he left the company. And six months after he left, because we had his email redirect to ours, people would be like, oh, I'm ready to talk now, you know, like, and I'm sure you've experienced if you try to hire, like, it's a long lead process. And we were actually pretty bad salespeople at, at Instagram. There's a really funny core question, actually, that is funny to read, which is, did anybody turn down a job at Instagram free acquisition? Yeah. And it's like, I look at each one of them, and they're like, yeah, I just didn't see the opportunity. And like, yeah, I just didn't see that. Again. And like, it's, I, I, I think that's a great answer, not because like, haha, -ha. it was like, I, because like, they were right, like, we didn't do a good job of like, kind of pitching it and like making it clear why, you know, and we got much better at it. And like in times at Instagram when we were bigger, I was effectively a full-time recruiter, right? Mm -hmm. But um, at the time, especially, you know, to be fair, we were three engineers, this thing was scaling. We were really busy doing everything else and we just didn't dedicate the time. But like, that's an excuse. When I look at, when you think about the psychological aspect of it, like one of the hardest things is to tear yourself away from this thing that has very instant rewards, which is like you're coding, you like finish something, it's ready, you're like, push it to production, you know, at the time maybe a million people are using it and like I'm gonna send the like hundredth cold call email with like somebody's gonna reply and tell me they're not interested or not reply at all. It's a lot like, you know, uh, very different sort of um, like reward pattern. So it's like, I think it's normal for founders to not enjoy that part. I mean, I'm not sure anybody loves that part, you know. Um, I think eventually what broke that log jam, one was um, uh, at the time, the folks at Greylock had a really good in-house recruiter. And as like companies were winding down, they would often like send them our fo their folks. And we had some awesome hires from that, or people reached out to them and be like, hey, I'm interested in working in one of your portfolio companies. Um, and like getting creative with things. Like we ran a coding com competition where you had to like take a, a like ripped up image and stitch it back together. Um, I started going on Hacker News and finding the people that like had intelligent comments. That's how we hired our first in in ops engineer. He was like a very good, like he was like clearly the one person in the comment thread that understood things. And I was like, hey, like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, like I work on Cassandra, but I'm like, look, you know, interested in the job. So yeah. they're like getting creative and breaking free of that. And that's like what I tell people today. Like now looking back with hindsight, like, you know, we got to operate both, you know, pretty independently of Facebook. So we had our own hiring pipeline, but we also got to plug into theirs. Like, competing with their like massive scale of like recruiters, et cetera, like you have to be scrappy, like look in unfamiliar places, like look with unfamiliar backgrounds, like don't get super attached to the degree, which like in the end is like only, you know, only gonna tell you where they went to school and maybe they did well, then maybe they learned, you know, interesting things there. Um, I think you can be a lot more expansive in who you take on, which eventually is what we did. Like when you looked at our first six engineers pre-acquisition, I think, did the math ones, I think three finished college, one never even went to college, one dropped out. It was like, you know, people would not like a pedigree. It's people who were just really fun to work with that we ended up clicking really well with. 
Mm -hmm. What's your advice to founders in the room about how to recruit, given you know that experience that you've had, you know, on that? It's it's really kind of like a learning curve. It sounds like how to recruit well. Yeah, I think be willing to make more mistakes. Like um, you know, in like psych research, there's like type one and type two errors. Like I feel like we had way more false negatives than we should have. I remember like the one really really clear one I had is like there was a super good engineer at Twitter really good web developer. We were trying to hire our first like web engineer and um, you know we like interviewed him and the interview process that I described at the time is that um, I've never been a fan of whiteboard interviews probably because I'm bad at them. Like I, I wouldn't hire me so like this is not a good selective process for uh, or I wouldn't be hired by myself through that process. Um, so what we would have is like a uh, fair amount of like interactive time and then a four hour sort of coding exercise where people would come in and have like four hours of like some coding task like um, you, uh, the server one was um, use our API to build a very simple recommendation system around like if I like this photo, what else might I like? If you were a web engineer, it was like a Google yeah. Maps and Instagram photos mashup, stuff like that. So it's stuff that was outside of our code base, but like somehow tangentially related. So at least we were like in the building talking about Instagram stuff. Mm -hmm. And it turns out if you've been working at Twitter, for example, and using Bootstrap or using whatever like web framework they were using, starting from scratch in four hours is actually really hard because you take so much for granted at that point. You're like, oh wait, I don't have this library function that oh crap, like how do I do this in JavaScript without the library? And like people would, you know, we had we rejected a bunch of people that in retrospect I'm like they would have been great. And I I think we were just like thinking about things the wrong way and too afraid to make mistakes. Um, I think it took us a while to like reorient um, to that. I mean, it's not to say that you shouldn't hire carefully, but I think like, yeah, I think design your process so that like you have a pretty good sense. Like what I, the one of the best engineers of the first ten I hired, I actually never coded with him. Basically, I'd seen his GitHub code. He came in. I spent four hours commiserating about AWS with him, and at the end, I'm like, either this guy is the greatest bull bullshit artist I've ever met, or like <laughs> has incredibly relevant experience, and he's like great to work with and interact with. Um, and it was like a fantastic hire. Um, he was like Instagram for eight years. So you know, be creative. Like trust more of your sense. Like when you think about big companies hiring processes, they are built for scale. They are basically built to remove as much individuality from the decision making. Past like really good interviewers who are going to contribute, you know, signal, um, but they're not, you know really set up for like, well, we spent, you know, four hours together and like we built something together where we like looked at like another person and this is all in the theme of like get creative with your recruiting practices. Um, we hired this amazing, uh, he was 20 years old at the time. Guy hadn't even finished his degree, but he had like one last project that he was able to do remotely. And he was in the Bay Area for two days for a Facebook like all night hackathon, which I think is something they used to do. I don't think they really do that anymore. Yeah. And we were like, we'd seen him online. We're like, this guy seems great. We're like, emailed him. He's like, I like, I'm just gonna be in town for this hackathon. We're like, come in the next morning, and he did. And like, he had just pulled an all nighter. And we're like, we're not gonna make you whiteboard code or even like do an exercise. Like, let's look at the code you wrote last night. And we get it. It was like hackathon code. It's not gonna be perfect. But like, what did you do? And he's like, oh. And like, you know, after like an hour with him, we're like, yeah. Like, guy likes to think in a really good way and like solves problems in interesting ways. And like, we were kind of willing to, to take that bet. Would you have felt more comfortable leaning to the risk of the false positive hires, like knowing what you know now? Like, would you have implemented one of these? You know, like some companies are famous, like Zappos, for the, yeah, we'll hire you, and if it's not working out for some period of time, we'll like mutually agree not to have you work anymore. And yeah, send I mean, you on your way. Terrifying with as a first time founder when you've yeah. never let somebody go, you never like dealt mm -hmm. with like probably, you know, you've managed at another company, but a lot of people haven't. So, yeah, the unknown is really scary. And so you're like, I want to get it totally perfectly right. And, mm -hmm. You know, again, it's not to say that you shouldn't hire carefully, but like when folks are on the borderline or when like you, people often overweight how good their process is before it's actually that good when your end is like six. Right, know? right. What were the hardest roles for you to hire for? Was it areas like domains where you didn't have any expertise or previous experience or was it you know, an area like design or engineering that you know very well, is very close to your heart and this kind of the soul of the company? Like was it harder to hire for those roles because you, like, you know, it's like that founder like letting go control thing. It's, I think the company you found ends up dictating the kinds of hires that are easier and harder for you. Like Instagram is super design heavy. Like, you know, we've always put an emphasis on craft. Like design, hiring great designers was never a problem. Like people would redesign Instagram like for fun on dribble.com. Like they were like, it was, it was like, so that was, then it was like, all right, are they actually a good fit? And like, you know, do we like their design aesthetic? But there were enough really good people that that was the case. Yeah. Um, I think it was a consequence of the time, but like Android was always super hard to hire for. You know, um, like great Android engineers were 
always a challenge. Um, our first Android app was written 50% by an iOS engineer turned Android engineer and 50% by an actual Android engineer. You would get into some interesting arguments over the code. Um, but I think it was like always in like those moments of like where like the technology was, where they're good people, and being willing to say like, all right, I always believe you need at least one or two like expert people in that technology. It would have been a mess if we had written our Android app without that Android person, but it's okay to then compliment them with other people that were like ramping up and learning because the design patterns were there. Um, and I think that, that worked well. Like you need that expert, but then you can build out a like sort of training program around them. Hmm. Interesting. And so as you were scaling the company kind of past product market fit, what do you, this is a bit of a spicy question. Mm -hmm. What do you think was kind of the hardest for you personally, like to scale yourself? as a founder, right? You're on this incredible learning ramp as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's funny. If you read the like Medium articles about how to be a good CTO or VP Engineering, it's like, you need to be coding as little as possible. If you are coding, you are a failure. And uh, <laughs> I think that was literally one I read. Um, and I think that can be true, um, especially if the reason you're not letting go of coding is because like, you're the only one who knows something, or like, there's just not enough engineering talent, you've overcommitted on things, and you're jumping in on things. Um, and I think that was a mistake I made for a while. Like, there was a, um, a document that somebody made once called Stuff Only Mike Knows, and they're like, nobody else knows how to do this, Mike, and they're like, they had the, the full list. And the way, the reason it was really hard for me is it basically meant I was anchored to the company. Like, I couldn't really travel. If I traveled, I always had, we didn't have tethering on our phones at the time, like Sprint used to make this like 3G card you could plug into your phone. Like I had that with me at any given moment. The longest time I was ever offline was a 12 hour flight back home to Brazil. And when I landed, I literally ran to my dad's phone and like checked my mail. Of course, the site had gone down while I'd been away. Like, um, <laughs> like it, actually I had two emails. One was between them was like, Instagram's down. The other one was like, everything is okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, thank God for, <laughs> Chronological sorting there did not help. Um, um, so it was really being in the critical path and not having a built enough team. And I had this like very core belief that like I couldn't ask the team to be on call if I wasn't on call too. Um, and I held that on for a really, really long time. And the team was so small that like, you know, there were four or five of us on call. We were alternating on like a daily rather than a weekly basis. That was really hard. And that was like the type of like coding or technical involvement that actually is unhealthy and is really bad. But I think I was eventually able to detangle that from like, I really enjoyed being technically involved. So like I coded up to 2018 probably, or at least late 2017, which was like way later than you should be engineering. And like, but then I was picking like projects that were off the critical path. Like I always um, enjoyed the cat and mouse game of fighting spammers on Instagram. It's like intellectually interesting to me because mm -hmm. you're shipping binaries to like, you know, a billion people, which means that like people can introspect and like, all right, so how do you like ensure that it came from a real, it's like, it's a fun challenge. And it's always like a perpetual challenge. And like, obviously there were teams working on that from a daily basis, but I would have like crazy ideas. Like what if we did this and then like hack on it, like a project that would probably take three days normally for a normal person would take me a month, but like I could get it in there and I could commit it. And I found, or at least this is what I told myself, that it helped me in a couple of ways. One, I think it just built credibility with the engineering team. It's like, you're still in the weeds, you're still working on stuff. Um, two, it just gave you a really good snapshot of what the dev environment was like, because like dev environments, I think, uh, degrade on a very like slow but constant basis, and people don't notice. It's totally like boiling the frog, and then it's like four years in, and you're like, wow, like our you know our test coverage used to be awesome. Like I didn't feel like we had good tests here. Or, like our iOS app used to build in two minutes. It took me twenty. You know, like and uh, being able to agitate and say like, no, like how did we get here, and like is it a problem, and like can we make it better, it was like very helpful to dive in. Um, at those points, and plus I just found it fun, so that was kind of a way of myself staying engaged too. Yeah. Hmm. That's awesome that you were so hands-on and like so plugged into all those different pieces. How do you think about uh, you know the co-founder partnership? Like in your case, there is a CEO and CTO, and obviously you guys work super closely together. And how did that change as as, as you scaled? And you know even how does your role at CTO scale from two to <coughs> four hundred employees? Yeah, um, I find it. And I wish this for all of you. Um, it's very rare that like um, you know co-founders get along nine years in. Like it's a fair rarity. You know, when I look at like the batch of companies we kind of grew up with, some actually you know actually managed to keep co-founders around together, which is awesome. A lot didn't. I invested in a company where like the one co-founder got booted out after like, a couple of months. Like definitely co-founder drama is like not a uh, uncommon phenomenon. I think things that worked really well with me and Kevin. Um, 
I would say this, we never wanted each other's jobs. Like I didn't want to be CEO. I don't think he wanted to be CTO. Like it's not to say that like he couldn't have done good technology stuff and he did early on. And it's not to say that like I wasn't super involved in the product, but I think it's really, really helpful to have those clear roles from the beginning. You don't have to call them things, but like have a clear, like, you know, Apple likes to call them DRIs, directly responsible individuals. I like that term. It's like, who is the DRI on product decision making? Like who's the DRI on our fundraising round? Like who's keeping the site up? Who's hiring our engineers? And um, and then having the trust built up from then, you know, as I feel like I know there's definitely times of the of that journey where I spent way more time with Kevin than I did with my then girlfriend, now wife. Um, so we like know each other well. I think like the early stage, it was like a lot messier. We were both engineering, but he was doing more fundraising. I was doing more like kind of like deep technical work, scaling the systems. And as we scaled, I think a lot of his focus shifted to how do we start building the business out? How do we hire a COO? How are we going to monetize? How are we going to like do ads? Um, and for me, it was like, all right, we really need to build out a real team with multiple offices and multiple engineering leaders and, and doing that out. Um, and we always came together on product, which I think was always our like our core passion. Um, and I think we had like, it's useful if you have um, the ability to be calming influences on each other. Like, I kind of see two kinds of co-founders, the two that like when things get bad kind of become like a self-reinforcing like yeah. spiral of badness. And then other ones that are able to be like, all right, like, Yes, it sucks, but let's look at it this way. And we've played that role with each other a lot over over the years. Um, and then in terms of the CTO role change, like I've come to this belief, and I'm happy to have any of you challenge me on this because I don't have enough data. It's just like a belief that I hold, at least for companies like Instagram, that like either you have a like co-founder who's a CTO and like scales with that role, you know, and you can bring in a VPN. Or you probably shouldn't really have a CTO unless you're really in like a super deep technology business. I think it's a super hard role to hire for. Right? I've been advising some companies that are like at the 40 to 50 engineer scale and like kind of need more technology leadership. But like bringing in a CTO at that point who's probably not going to be engineering every day, mm -hmm. but is going to be setting engineering direction is like, I'd love to hear examples of how it was done well. Like I think Werner at Amazon is an amazing example, but like that's a really good deep technology stack that he was able to like go and, and do, and I think he's been there for a long time. Um, so my role, you know, I think was at different points, different percentages of co-founder, different percentages of CTO, and different percentages of VP Eng. At one point I brought in a head of Eng, so I got to do mostly technology and co-foundery stuff. Um, at some point I was mostly building the team and I got to do very little engineering. Um, but I think as a co-founder, like being able to dial that up or down and not be super like be okay with your role being kind of a fake role like my like my at one point my org structure was I had one direct report it was my VP of Eng and like that's like not a structure you would design on paper ever like I mean my performance review season was awesome I had one performance review to write um, but like and it's like not optimal from like you know it's just but like it worked well because like I had more context on on the technology stuff it made sense for him to report to me so like I don't know as a I guess I say this as a co-founder. As a co-founder, I feel like you should have the um, permission to like design things that are a little suboptimal and design things that are mostly around like the consequence of like how things got that way, mm -hmm. um, and know that it's unique. But like you have context that makes that workable. Yeah, and it'll probably change in six months anyway. Exactly. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so we have a mic going around. Uh, so if you are going to ask a question, please raise your hand, and the mic will kind of around eventually come to you. So, Ruchi, you're gonna ask the first? Yeah, I'm gonna go for the first question. So, I remember um, when Instagram first launched, and I actually know a lot of your early investors, there were a lot of competing products on the market. There was one in um, that Andreessen Horowitz invested in. I mean, Facebook obviously had its photos product that had taken off by then. Um, how did you, so when you were building Instagram, were you thinking about how you could differentiate yourself from all of them, or were you thinking about just the MVP that you needed to build to get out there? Um, it's a really good question. And I remember when we were going from Bourbon to Instagram, I turned to Kevin and I said, like, we can't work on a photos app. Like, look at Crunchbase. There's all these dead photo apps around. And like, there are, like, 20, 2007 to 2010, there were a ton of people either on desktop on mo or mobile that were trying to do that. And there were a ton that were live at the time, too. I think by asking ourselves like what did people need at every stage, we ended up backing into a very um, like I hate the word viral, but basically like a product that like was really exciting for people to spread. And what I mean by that was like we were in our heads we're like, well, what's the first problem people have when they sign up? It's like oh, it's like really hard to find your friends. Like 
like it's a pain in the butt to go like search for them by email. Like, great, let's build out. And like, from day one, we had Twitter and Facebook uh, like contact importer. Maybe we even had a dress book from day one, or we launched it soon afterwards. Turns out that's an awesome growth strategy, and like it's really useful to be able to like build your graph quickly. But it was just it's interesting to put our our, our like rewind to that time. The conversation was not what's our like growth strategy for onboarding? It was like, oh, it's like sucks to like find people. Let's like make that really easy. Like, oh, your photos like look ugly. Let's make them look really good. And you know, there were other apps that did that, but like we made it really streamlined. And so I think it was, oh, and then the last one was, hey, we didn't want these things to feel like they're just stuck on this platform that's new. So like, let's let you share them to the web. And like, you know, when you clicked on the web, if you remember like early Instagram, it was like the photo that was you clicked on and on the right, it was like, hey, there's this app called Instagram. Maybe you can download it if you want to make photos like this. Um, so I'm not gonna say by accident, because I think we were being intentional, but by accident, we ended up creating a product that one, solved the core mechanic really well of like sharing photos quickly and making them look good, but two, also had the other legs of the chair really well built out from the beginning. Not like super polished, but they were there. Like it was easy to find people, it was easy to make an account, it was easy to share your stuff off platform, and therefore people were clicking in, like getting back into the product. And that meant we grew really, really quickly, really, 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 really soon because people got excited that suddenly you can make your photos look good and there was like a very natural path to telling other people about it and for those people to then to then sign up and grow. It's a really different world now with um, advertising and uh, like specific app advertising like that didn't really exist at the time. So I think making your mark in the app landscape is much more difficult. Um, but I think among our competitors, when I looked at them often, like you'd sign up for them and it was like, welcome, you have like an empty feed. Like maybe you should follow these like three suggested people that you don't know. Like or enter their email and you're like, it's, this is really, really hard. Um, so I think like, I still see, by the way, companies get this wrong. Like if you can't get people on board and get people connected to people who they like want to talk to, and I don't mean just by like, you know, it's like searching for their usernames, like it's going to be really hard for them to retain past that first, those first couple of days. Now that you sold Instagram and you left, you change a lot, I guess. Like what have you changed and what haven't you changed like looking at your past and like how successful you are like uh, about my personality, personality? And like, <laughs> this is a question for glow <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um <laughs> you think you changed it all? it's a really interesting question um i think what i brought to the table with instagram was like the ability to remain calm under like craziness, like the site's down, like somebody has to fix it. You can either freak out or you can get your hands like on the laptop and go fix it. I think that was like a constant throughout. Um, it's a super good question. I, it's, it's probably a hard one to introspect on yourself, you know, uh, from, from like up close. I'd say that the thing that I became most comfortable with as we grew was like able to be a public voice for Instagram. Because at some point it became clear that like just having Kev be that public voice was like very taxing on him because you know, you're doing all the interviews. And two was limiting us how we talked about us from like a tech perspective. Like, hey, we actually are, you know, operating Python and Django at like a pretty unprecedented scale. Like we're doing interesting things eventually in ML. So um, I think learning to get comfortable with that. And it's like funny when you do your first media training and you're like, oh, I'm gonna say like the dumbest thing and then like <laughs> actually doing it and getting used to it. Like um, we had a weekly, you know, we started this when we were literally in the 181 South Park and then brought it in as we scaled, which was every Friday we got together with the whole company. Ours was like a day morning, like donuts and coffee because Zuck did his 4 p.m. happy hour and we like obviously did not want to overlap. People could go to both. Um, and also getting in front of your whole team every single week and having them ask you hard questions. They weren't always hard, but like sometimes we get hard questions. Um, was really good training for when, like uh, Mark, when he got back from the congressional hearings and people were like, you did an amazing job. He's like, well, I get to take hard questions every week. It's actually extremely good uh, training for, for that. So I think like just growing the company itself was helpful in, in developing the skills to be able to represent the company externally. That's probably the thing I became the most comfortable with other than management. Like I literally had not managed a single, like I always joked with our team. I was like, look, we're gonna make some mistakes because every person we hire is by default, that biggest team I've ever managed. And like, you have to be <laughs> humble and say like, I am learning and I'm gonna make some mistakes. And like, that's probably like the thing I had the least idea of how to do. Like the first time you have to let somebody go, like how do you convince an incredible person to join your team when they have like an offer somewhere else that's like 50% greater um, or like skills. I, but I think core personality is hard to change. Like it probably gets expressed at more extremes as things scale, but probably harder to, to change.
Thank you so much for coming. I'm curious because I've heard the numbers the first month were stupefying in terms of Instagram's growth. So can you talk a little bit about the transition from bourbon to Instagram, what you did maybe as a go to market and what those numbers were the first day, the first month and how little sleep you might have gotten through that process? Our go to market, we started like showing the app like this was we were still in Dogpatch Labs over on the pier. I actually walked by there today. Um, I think there's anything there right now. Um, we had this insight that photographers were not gonna like Instagram, and they didn't for a long time. Like for actual photogra photogra like pro photographers were like, I hate the filters, it's like not cool. Like, uh, oh my God, your photos at the time were 306 pixels by 306 pixels, which was directly related to like the speed of upload question. Like they like vomited over Instagram, a lot of them did. Some got it, and some were like, this is just not for me. I'm like gonna stick to Flickr, I can do my like 10 megapixel photo there. Um, but we realized there was this other group of people that were really into photography, but not professionally, and those were designers. So our first, like, the way we seeded the community was we went out to Dribbble. We basically looked at the leaderboard on Dribbble. If you guys don't know Dribbble, it was kind of like Twitter for designers. So you post like snippets of what you're working on. Um, and we basically emailed like the top Dribbble users, kind of like a funny group to go after. And we're like, hey, we love your design work. Um, would you be interested in trying a new app? And I did this for a bunch of people. And it's funny, I should go back and see some of those initial emails. Because some people were like, no. And some people were like, oh yeah, sure, I'll try it. And we added it to them to the test flight. And what was interesting about that is that they started posting on their Twitter. This was pre-launch. So basically they would post to their Twitter like, you know, posted just photo, just took a photo on Instagram and people would click the link. And at the time it wasn't even like, go download this app. It was like, here's a cool photo. Enter your email to get notified when this thing launches. Um, like very like bare bones landing page. But it started ticking up this interest like, oh, people are taking photos in this like interesting way. Like what's going on? And like um, it meant that like by launch day, I'm gonna forget like, but our, our mailing list of like people who were interested was like in the maybe thousands to low tens of thousands, which was like pretty good for something that we had we'd built up. Now the funny thing is, writing the script to go email those people was number like maybe 20 on the list of priorities and we got to like numbers like one through eight so like we actually it took us days to email i would get all these angry responses into like the contact email I'd be like why did it take you guys like a week to email me like why did i even sign up bother signing up so like in the end i think it was more about generating interest than it was about necessarily having the contact point because once we launched like we did get the like TechCrunch, you know what was big at the time giga ohm you know kind of like coverage and that was enough to get people to be like, oh yeah, like that's the thing that this like designer I follow has been posting. You know, Chris Messina, who's like a very early Twitter user, was a very early IG user. He's at Chris on Instagram still. Um, and he was posting to his followers. He had probably like at the time tens of thousands of followers. So it was seeding it with people. I guess today you'd call them influencers. They weren't called those at the time, but like people who were, we respected their design and they were interested in trying something new and they resonated with the aesthetic. Um, and then, you know, having them play out. And then from there so to the numbers, like, I had a bet with Kev. He's like, how many people are going to sign up on day one? And I was like, I picked a number. Like, I said 25,000. He said 2,500 because bourbon had 2,000. We're like, if we double that, it's going to be good. Um, and we got like basically 25,000 exactly that day. Um, so it was like 25,000 signups the first day, about 100K by the end of the first week, about a million in about like a month and a half. So it was pretty rapid. Um, the first like week though was like, I'm amazed anybody retained past that week because we were down so often. Like we were literally running all of Instagram on a single um, like right like VPS in LA. I had no scaling experience. Like literally one box serving. Like it was ridiculous. Uh, and so like the site kept crashing. Eventually, like after a week, we migrated to AWS. Like one of the reasons I'm like a very big believer in the commons and these kinds of spaces is like it was so valuable for us at Dogpatch to like raise our hands and be like. Who's worked on AWS? Because we need to basically like migrate our entire system like tonight, and having people be like, "Oh, I I did," and like you know we were able to like work with them and like and and have an idea of, of how to like cross pollinate. But it was crazy. Like that those months of like like you're always behind, right? Like you're always trying to add capacity. You're always trying to re-engineer the system while it's growing and learning all of that. By the way, because I was mostly a like UI like mobile engineer, not a server side person. And you didn't have a wait list that entire time. Um, no, we like, I think, the, I think Gmail had done the waitlist thing, but like we were like too busy to even implement the waitlist. So it was like <laughs> people would like sign on and like hopefully not, it wouldn't crash. And um, yeah, again, it's like, it speaks to like, if you have something that really is resonating with people, they'll actually put up with a quite a bit of instability if it's like, you know, not after a while, but like at least in those early days they did. So uh, I'm just curious kind of how you built up your personal just like support structure and, and growth structure. 
uh, particularly, you know, it seems like there are probably a lot of stressors for an immigrant. The company is growing, and as a, uh, as so I'm a founder, and it's like as a company grows, there's like less and less people you can talk to about less and less things. Mm -hmm. You know, your investors at some point start to be very wary of uh, you bitching about co-founders and issues. So how did you deal with that, uh, both at the early stages and as the company got really big? Um, I think your angel investors can help. Like, they often have less, they will freak out less if they're like, if you're, if you're talking about drama. I think once you're an institutional investor, I think you have like more of a sense of responsibility if somebody comes to, you want us to fix the problem. Um, but I think you can be a little bit more vulnerable. My example is like, we called Adam D'Angelo, who's one of our angels, um, and he'd been CTO at Facebook, and we're like, we have no idea how to scale this thing. Like, pl like please help. And like, basically coached us through like, well, here's how like you might partition your database. It was like the most helpful, like, our call, I think, probably in the first like month of Instagram. So I think that side of the investment can be helpful. Sometimes institutional folks can too, but like I think angels particularly can. Um, for us, I felt like we were kind of in a cohort, um, and this happens with companies, right? Like you know, you look at like companies around like found around 2009, 2010, and like we ended up staying in touch with a lot of those folks. And like it's helpful to be like you know, Open Door was started, or sorry, Next Door was started, and maybe or pivoted maybe a couple years later and be able to like call up their VP engine and be like, what are you doing on Postgres? Or they'd call me and be like, we need this kind of thing. And so like, it's helpful to stay in touch with this kind of network. I think that, that matters a lot. Um, and what else? I'd say like then also like having a support system that is as far from tech as possible really matters too. And so like for me that was like cycling, like, you know, we'd go out riding to like, you know, Marin and like do that like that was like a very good way of clearing your head like um, staying connected to the friends who like know you as a person not as a founder matters a ton as well like making the time for that and don't get me wrong I missed a ton of like weddings and events because like things were crazy and scaling but like hopefully they'll understand if like they're also seeing this like if the reason you're missing their thing is like uh, big enough to be a news story it's probably like a decent ish excuse um, but I think that mattered a lot too and like um, I underestimated the importance of like, it's a cliche, but like exercise and sleep like actually is super, super key. And like, it took me years to like really prioritize and make time for that. And I think it mattered a lot in like navigating the stress down the line. Um, so a lot of people think you have good music taste. What are you listening to? Uh, um, I like, it's been really, so it's, this is a funny conversation to have in English because my last two fireside chats have been in Portuguese and they were back to back and it was like, funny to me to be like, I actually haven't done very many of them, so like reorienting them myself and like, how do I talk about the startup journey in Portuguese? I don't actually have the vocabulary for it in some places. Um, but it's been really cool to reconnect with Brazilian music, um, which I think has been like something that um, has like, you know, was part of my life growing up and it was always like a cool like antenna back to Brazil. And they're having a really cool moment now, I think. So, um, Ching Bernardes, like Tim, the name like Tim, and then I think Bernardes, it's hard to, Autocorrect is pretty good, is amazing. And like, I think one of the most talented musicians making music like anywhere right now. Um, so I've listened to his, well, his stuff I'll a lot. Have to go check him out. Yeah, he's really yeah. good. You don't have to even understand Portuguese. I think the music is like, stands on its own. Nice. Um, so Instagram's a really large platform and we kind of had this conversation um, when talking about something else, but what are some of the crazier out there trends, ideas, et cetera, that you noticed on the Instagram platform um, and the way the consumers were behaving. Yeah, I think in the theme of like so much of the launches that we did, almost all the really big ones probably came from some weird way people were misusing the platform. Like stories came, I mean, the format we obviously adopted from Snapchat, but the fact that we were working on a way of sharing more casual content came from the fact that people were creating what was called Finstagrams. Basically they would create second accounts and only give it to like their close friends and yeah, and what we did, Kevin and I were like, we should make a Finstagram. So like, we made two Finstagrams, and we were posting, and we're like, oh, this is fun again. Because like, basically, Instagram, especially our accounts, which were like the earliest accounts, had like a reasonably sized following. Like, we're just stop being fun to post with, and all of a sudden, like, we're like, oh, huh? Like, if I can post stuff that's like more casual to a smaller audience, like, it's this. There's nothing wrong with the product. It's just missing this ability to do this, and obviously, it's hard to get people to to feel like. Getting people to create a second account would have been like a big lift, but letting them use Instagram in a new way was that one. So um, the stuff that's really interesting nowadays that like I don't understand because I feel old now is um, one is shared accounts. So um, there's this phenomenon called flop accounts and they're basically, um, they started as like ways of posting um, flops, which is like basically fails, like the new way of saying fail if you're like a teenager now. I'm sure flop is old school now too, it's like not cool anymore, but uh, like you'd be like, oh, this person really flopped when they did this. But then what happened 
uh, so, and then you would give the credentials out to maybe like a group of like seven people, like maybe in your school or maybe people you know, and anybody could post flops. What's happening is that people would post like a flop of, I don't know, uh, a political figure. And then the comments started being about like that issue. So like, it's weird the way that like Instagram started being used by these group, like these teens to like discuss not just, you know, everyday things, but like bigger picture things like what's going on in Congress and like, but in the guise of not like somebody posting like an opinion piece, but instead these like very different uh, setups that like that almost gave them the permission to do that. So I think that's super interesting. I think the rise of like 3D generated Instagram celebrities is bizarre. And I think a pretty interesting thing, you know, like uh, I'm sure if you Google like 3D generated fake Instagram people, I forgot the name of the, the couple. There's like a series of them that are all like friends with each other and like have you seen these they're crazy they're like i mean 3d <laughs> graphics have gotten good it still is in definitely in the like uncanny valley although maybe starting to emerge from it um but they'll have them pose they get brand deals and so they're getting like tens of thousands of dollars per pose it's weird and wacky um but like in this world when we we're having a conversation over dinner like you know you see like speech synthesis and video lip syncing and all these things like emerge like there's a bunch of scary applications for that i think there's also going to be some really interesting like entertainment applications of that around emergent celebrities that are actually not real and like if they're not real they're like infinitely scalable it's like super weird and interesting so i think that's an awesomely bizarre phenomenon that we had no real influence on other than providing the platform for um let's see if I have any other ones that i think are super interesting those are the two like most out there ones I would say. Oh, Live was something that took us by surprise. Like we launched Instagram Live probably a couple years ago and we kind of saw two very sort of like barbell use cases. Like you have your um, Taylor Swift going live backstage before a concert, awesome content. If you're a Taylor Swift fan, like you're getting a season that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, like really obvious like application of that technology or she live streaming during a live show. And then this other use case, which was like, often teens brought like live broadcasting to their friends and not it being about something interesting that they were doing, but just as a way of having like an open channel of communication and that being really interesting. So if you actually look now, um, you know, like the live product in direct became way more oriented towards it. So that product came from seeing that like, it's not that people really wanted to broadcast live to like hundreds of people. They actually just wanted to have a live video conversation plus the ability to browse Instagram with like, you know, eight to 15 of them. So that was another like, Emergent again. I don't go live with my friends, but like teens do while they're doing their homework, and that's like fun for them. We can have a flopstagram together, Mike. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Like one of the things like I've noticed about like the trajectory of Instagram is that it started off with like a community that you like understood and were adjacent to, like the dribble kind of connection that you mentioned earlier. But then eventually, like now everybody's using it. Like the Kardashians are using it. Like teens who are way cooler than like we could ever hope to be ourselves are using it. So how do you build a product that like makes sense and like is appealing to those people who like, at this point you've gotta be super disconnected from either like really cool celebrities or like teens who are just like in their own different world. I think it takes a lot. So we, it probably the shift kind of happened as we grew internationally, that was a big moment, right? When you're like, oh, I no longer understand all the like cultural context that people are using Instagram in. Um, and as we like just expanded across demographics, I think the two things that worked the best, one was user research. Like we built out a like, really good user research team and they would do things like, so we would have a thing like, oh, in France, people are following more celebrities than normal people. Like we should go like understand why that is. Let's best way to do that is probably to go to France. And obviously this is like when you're bigger and you can like afford to like go to France. But like, um, and we would always bring the product team or members of the product team on those trips. And it was so valuable because I, I learned very quickly and my degree is in human computer interaction, right? And so like you learn all these like cool user research techniques and you also realize if you've ever done this or like worked in a company like, nobody is able to empathize with user research reports unless they're like extremely good. But even those like people are like, Oh, that is interesting. But like in the back of your head, you're like, ah, oh, but you talked to like eight people. That's a small sample size. Or like, ah, oh, maybe it was just that guy. Or like, I, I don't think this will solve it. But there's something very different when you send your product team there because like now they've seen stuff up close and really felt it and got to ask the follow-up questions that make it like feel real. And then they would come back and be like, oh, we're totally changing our France strategy and we're doing this stuff all really differently. So um, 
yeah, like user research with these different demographics, like include, including your team, it feels wasteful in a minute. You're like, wow, we're taking like our best engineer and we're like sending them to like France for three days. And like, it's actually not fun really as a trip. Like you're like packed from like eight to eight doing interviews. But the insights from that were really, really valuable. And then for the demographics or sort of groups that were uniquely important and uniquely uh, had unique needs, we ended up building out partnerships or other roles inside the company for them. And the one that's like most like interesting for us is like emerging um, creators. So like IGTV is very much just geared towards like those emergent creators. And we had people on the team. There was actually just an article about uh, Justin Anthony, who was the one of the leads on that uh, down in LA. We had like a small LA office. I forget where, if you like Google his name, I guess you can see the article on it. And it's really fun because it's like a good glimpse at what his work is, which is spotting talent, but from inside the company and then like making sure that they have a point of contact if like their Instagram gets hacked or like they don't know how to use something or they're curious about how they like might like do something differently, um, having those connection points mattered a lot. So I guess to summarize, it's like being able to like get out of the room and like going to talk to people, even if it means crossing borders, but also bringing in-house expertise where it's uniquely important and like, you know, an ongoing problem rather than more of like a point in time question. So I'm sure when you were at Bourbon and thinking of pivoting to Instagram, it wasn't a complete flop show at Bourbon. There must have been some users who really liked it. So how did you decide not to double down on that and go to complete something completely different versus just persevering and keeping on doing that? It took us a long time, I think because we had people who loved it. Like we, like I remember Kev, when he pitched Bourbon to investors was like, this is Chantel, who's like a real person, a friend of ours at the time. Like she like, and she was using Bourbon a ton. And like, you know, what was really painful was that she was on an Android. So when we pivoted to Instagram, she couldn't use the product we pivoted to. It was like the most disappointing thing uh, for her. So I think the two hardest things are one, you are gonna disappoint people who are using even the initial thing that you have. I mean, we weren't at massive scale, but it was even worse. It's like friends and families plus. So like it's people who have our email addresses who are gonna be loudly complaining. But two, like it is probably having some utility to them or it's fun for them. And that's why like, Bourbon did not really grow in user base from like January when Kevin and I started talking to like August when we, like maybe more people signed up in terms of actives, it was basically flat. Um, so it wasn't like, you know, either growing or shrinking, but we kept convincing ourselves that there was more that we could do. And uh, like, the I, I have a, a user uh, sketch that I remember like so vividly because we'd always gotten the advice of like, do the simple thing first, like focus on one thing, do one thing really, really well. like. People aren't going to use this thing that does four things. I remember us being like, but maybe ours is the exception. Like, you're never the exception, right? And I remember I remember this sketch, which was like the posting screen from Bourbon was going to be like this quadrant where you could like post a photo or a video or a check-in or something else. And like, you know, we're like, yeah, we're going to do that. And it's like, ours is going to be good because it's going to be well designed. And like, no, it's like it, you needed to simplify. So um, yeah, I, for us, what was really, really valuable actually was um, seeing, getting out of the room and seeing how complex our value prop was when we explained it to people. Um, like we'd go out to uh, bars like Rick House, which is still around, um, and we'd talk to people and like friends of friends and they'd be like, what are you working on? And we're like, oh, we're like making this thing. And they're like, cool, what is it? And we're like, it's this platform where you can post like photos or check in. And also there's like a competition and there's a leaderboard and you can make plans with your friends. And by the way, it's HTML5 and like, it was just this like sentence that got like longer and longer. And obviously this is different if you're doing B2B and like you have a more nuanced value prop. But for us, like, especially in consumer, I think like if you cannot distill it down to something that is like understandable at a bar by a friend of a friend, like you're probably not gonna be able to like explain it to the world. And it was enough of those moments and one really particularly bad one where we're like, no, we can't just, we need to stop convincing ourselves that we're the exception. We're like adding more stuff or making it like faster is gonna make the difference. We could have done it four months before. The fun fact is we actually had an intuition that it wasn't working and built this thing called Scotch because it was the evolution of bourbon. Um, and it's funny, I really wish I had screenshots of it because it was basically Instagram but um, rotated 90 degrees. So it was like Instagram except you scrolled side to side and you swiped up to get comments. And we're like, ah, oh, the scrolling sucks. Like this isn't as like easy to use. And like what was funny is like, we had the right idea and the wrong UI and we were convinced ourselves that it was the wrong product, but actually only one of those two things were wrong. And then eventually we came around and did the exact same, basic exact same product, but with a vertical feed. And it was like, oh, that works, you know? It just took us <laughs> literally three months to get back around to it. Um, so you can make that mistake too. Like there's a good um, Bill Buxton, who's a UX like thinker paper or book called uh, about the difference between getting the right design and getting the design right. And like, like are you, 
is the product wrong or is this implementation of the product wrong? And like, question both, I guess, if you're in that moment where you're not sure if things are working. Great last question. With that, thank you so much, yeah. Mike, for joining us. Thank you.